Recording. Hello, everybody. I'm Levi Litvoy, and I'm talking to Benoit Riu uh, at the Catholic, from the Catholic University of Lavon, who is an expert on uh, qualitative and case-based research, comparative research. So welcome, Benoit, and thanks for joining us. Say hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. So, okay, so we're talking about case-based research and, uh, well, comparative case-based research. That's the uh, goal of uh, the conversation, to shed a little bit of light on this. I mean, it's almost ought to ask in political science, why is this important? Because this is so important and it's everywhere. But uh, but uh, let's say I'm coming from more of an anthropological world or I'm coming from uh, survey research. Uh, why should I care about case studies? <laughs> Tell me. Okay. All right. So, so let's uh, uh, broaden a bit the picture. You know, um, um, political science is part of social sciences, and social sciences have a long, well, a quite long history. And one of the foundations of social sciences is examining, uh, you know, stories and, and narratives uh, about cases. I mean, take the work of uh, Max Weber, one of the founding fathers of social sciences. Uh, so he he was looking, at, and also you know like. Uh, founding fathers of political science a long, long time ago, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville analyzing democracy in America, right? It's a case study. So a lot of founding pieces, a lot of also theories uh, in social sciences were born out of observing a particular, let's say, historical case. Let's say a country or a, a, a process, uh, uh, whatever, a crisis or revolution. The th thing about revolutions, uh, there's been, you know, there were also seminal books on, say, the French Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. So, in a way, uh, social sciences have a deep grounding in case, you know, case-oriented research, and uh, which implies that that basically one is looking in depth. That's kind of the important point: looking in depth at uh, a complex. A whole, a w h o l e, uh, a, a complex something is like a system, like a society. Uh, no matter what, what your case is, it could be an organization, it could be a uh, let's say the, the career of, of of a politician. That's a micro level case. It could be a whole political system. It's something quite complex that you need to look at uh, with multiple you know data sources and a lot of information. You need some knowledge about this particular system. That's let's say, one of the core foundations of case-oriented research. And what uh, yeah. Yeah, I've actually heard this claim that, uh, that the majority of evidence, the vast majority of evidence in political science clearly comes from case studies research. And I had to think about it for a second, but I actually do believe it. I think that's true. That's yeah, yeah. And, and besides, so it, it also means it, it, ha it has pros and cons. So a lot of our concepts, uh, you know, social science concepts uh, come from, say, a, a given case study. Um, you know, think about, uh, you know, uh, um, let's say the transformation of, of social movements. Usually it's, it was, uh, you know, built on the, the case studies say, on, on, of trade unions, for instance. Uh, or take uh, the Iron Law of Oligarchy by Roberto Michels. It was based on basically analysis of one single party in Germany. Uh, so sometimes uh, our theories are, let's say, linked to a specific case and they have a hard time traveling to other cases. That's another topic I'm going to cover shortly. So what can you do with case studies? Um, well, how to do and, and what can you do with them? I will come back to that a bit later, but basically case studies are really well designed to address deeper how questions. Uh, you cannot really, of course, generalize empirically. You cannot really address why questions. Uh, and that's more for, you know, larger N or at least variance-based research. That's another, another approach. So in a way, um, I want to broaden picture a bit. In a way, the contrast between case-based research on the one hand and variance-based research uh, on the other hand, or uh, as Charles Regan would put it, uh, variable-based uh, research, uh, uh, corresponds to a double contrast. Uh, the, the first contrast is the number of units you're going to, 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 to use in your analysis. Very mm -hmm. small n for case-based research versus quite a large N or possibly a very, very large N for variance based research because you do need, as you know, uh, a large number of units, cases uh, uh, in your matrix to, 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 to use statistics and, and to also produce inference, et cetera, et cetera. That's one, one contrast. And the other contrast is, is the kind of questions you can address. 
uh, uh, case-based research is about, again, you know, the deep understanding of a process within the system, uh, looking, uh, uh, you know, like with the uh, opening of the black box in a way of the case, of a single case or very few cases. Whereas, of course, in variance-based research, it's about, of course, drawing inferences and, and, and also, of course, um, um, adopting a more analytical view where you separate properties, right? Uh, uh, an independent variable and some, some dependent variables or vice versa, one dependent variable, right? And some independent variables that are going to contribute to the, that, have, that, are, that are going to have an effect on the, uh, 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 these are causes, right? Or causal variables that are going to have to an, an effect, more or less of, an, of a net effect on the dependent variable. All right. Mm -hmm. So final contrast, I would say, uh, and this was made perhaps a bit too simplistically, right? So one has to be a bit, a bit nuanced. Uh, so Charles Regin also suggested that when you do case-based research, you do holistic research. So mm -hmm. you renounce to the logic of variables. You think about a, a, a system as such, you don't really dif differentiate cause from effect. In a way. You, you just observe a process uh, or a complex system uh, uh, unfolding. And you renounce to the logic of, let's say, variables, right? Where you're going to separate properties. I think this is kind of a too simple uh, uh, view because, in fact, uh, as I will explain uh, afterwards, uh, you can also use the logic of variables in smaller end research. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the big picture. Okay. Let's, Let's perhaps you want me to zoom in a bit on case-based research. Uh, in no, absolutely, research. absolutely. I mean that's why we're here. So let's let's talk about it. Okay, and I think here one has to make a, a, a very deep distinction between, let's say, the real single case study uh, and what it's used for, and then another logic which is multiple cross-case research. I would call I would call this you know case-informed research, but. Uh, uh, necess that, that necessitates multiple cases, at least two actually, two or more. Okay. And then you, okay. you enter you enter the comparative domain, and that's something different. Okay. Yeah. So and that's 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 the title of your course. So uh, how does yeah, that yeah. relate to the course you're teaching? Yeah, yeah. So so shall I start perhaps from the single case or the comparative uh, logic? Okay. I mean, let's start from the single case. I think that's the normal progression, right? <laughs> okay. Great. Great. Okay. So. Um, Actually, um, well, let's perhaps discuss a bit the labels first. Uh, okay. I use the, 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 the label of case-oriented research or case-informed research or case-based research. These are more or less, these are used alternatively by different people. I recommend actually a really good, really good book thinking about these things. Uh, it's, a, it's a handbook of case-based case research by David Byrne. So not the, 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 the pop uh, singer from the Talking heads. Uh, that's uh, okay. Okay. Uh, because he's, he's actually even more uh, present on the on the web uh, than the, the sociologist uh, by David Byrne and Charles Regan in two thousand and nine. It's a really good book with multiple pieces, you know, reflecting about you know what it, what is case based research. Okay. So um, this is actually first and foremost a research approach, a, a way to approach let's say social scientific work, and it's an approach that is grounded let's say in uh, to cut a long story short, in case-based complexity. So um, uh, a case is a system as such, uh, and it is, because it is a system, uh, and, and it, it, it is also not so easy to grasp. It's complex because it's not so, so easy to grasp. Uh, first, you have to, even its contours are not so easy to, 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 to delineate. Mm -hmm. Let me here make a contrast. When you yeah. do a, a survey, a, a voting survey, for instance, the okay. cases are very obvious, right? The units, it's voters yeah. or respondents People, to the yeah. survey, right? And yeah. the time frame is very obvious. It's at a given point in time you do the survey, right? Yes. So yes, yes. Each unit is is delineated in time and space very easily, uh, and you okay. can identify and separate each unit uh, quite easily. Respondent one and two and three and four, right, etc. Um, well, if you take something like let's say a company or a political party. Let's take a okay. political party as an organization. Where does it start? Where does it end? Uh, do, are you going to also comprise the, the party, uh, let's say, um, sympathizers, people are, who are not members of the party, but are occasionally you know, supporting the party? Are they part of the party or not? What is in, in and out of the case? 
Mm -hmm. uh, when does this party, this, this object become a party? Because usually you want to look at this case over time. So when does a proto party become a party? Mm -hmm. When does a social movement or a political movement become a party? So when, when do you start? When does your time window start for the analysis? And I suspect the answer to that question is very much dependent on what you're doing and not necessarily based on some set of rules, right? Yes. And so basically, uh, if it's a quite, uh, uh, let's say, established or routinized case, you can use the literature around there, right? Uh, I, I worked myself uh, in the pure century when I was doing a PhD on, uh, you know, green parties. Uh, and so there was out there, there, there was some literature, there were, there were four criteria uh, that these, that the party should, should meet to, uh, you know, to, to be such a party. So you first have to create the case. You have to name the case. It's called, you know, casing. You have to, to use the right concept and you have to uh, delineate its contours empirically in time and space. And it is not obvious. So in a way you have to produce the case and it's always a matter of, of, of you know, of, of, of discussion. Take another example. Uh, think, think about um, uh, uh, something like a post-colonial system. Okay. Uh, when does this system start? Is it when the, 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 the colony stops being a colony or is it before even, right? When the system is already in transformation or in flux? Or is it when the system becomes stabilized with less, let's say, uh, influence from the, from the former, uh, former center country or the, the occupier in a way? So all mm -hmm. these things are, are matter to discussion and to arbitrations and to dispute in a way. And that's one of the difficulties of case-based research because each researcher will bring his or her own uh, this, you know, definitions. Yeah, all right. Makes sense. And so when, as, when you have designed, when you have, uh, let's say, as soon as you have identified your case, named it, of course, you also have your research question. And research question will typically be a how question. So how... Uh, can I understand, how can I un un unpack the process leading to something, to some event, typically. So, and let's call this an outcome. Okay. Now here, here there is a, a distinction between, let's say, deep qualitative uh, researchers, deep qualitative people who will say, you cannot separate cause from effect, right? It's part of, a, of, 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 of the same story, like you will do in anthropology, for instance, right? You just observe the, the full thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You renounce to analytical thinking. You don't, don't separate cause from effect. I would say that it's usually possible to try to separate cause from effect. And so to look at some sort of event at the end of the story, right? Something is happening or not. Like in Tunisia in 2011, at some stage, this, the regime collapses. Uh, all right, interesting thing, because usually these regimes don't collapse. They face yes. all sorts of problems. And they don't, this one has collapsed apparently in connection with some sort of a series of events, uh, like uh, somebody, you know, uh, um, um, uh, somebody protesting and somebody who, you know, um, burned himself alive, right, who died, uh, uh, and then there were some riots, and then there was the army intervening, or not intervening, by the way, etc. And then you, you, you can try to trace the whole story that leads to the, the fall of the regime in Tunisia, and surprisingly, perhaps uh, uh, not in similar other countries, potentially, you could do perhaps two case studies to examine uh -huh. this contrast. Okay, now here, perhaps I'm already moving to comparison, but okay, you look at yes. this single case study and this single case study is then used, not necessarily to test theory. Uh, okay, you're gonna use bits and pieces of theory out there, but usually you, you would follow a relatively more inductive logic. So based on your observation, you are going to basically enrich existing theories, or you're going to perhaps revisit some concepts. Say uh, in Tunisia, uh, the classical concept of, of civil society perhaps needs to be a bit re redefined a bit because it's a different, it, it's a particular, let's say cultural area, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the, exactly. the, the, the purpose will not be theory testing, but more, more like theory elaboration or, or enrichment or concept development. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, that's basically what you, what you have to do. What you can do with uh, in case studies typically. Of course, the, the, the big caveat here, the big challenge is getting access to the case. Um, the, the, the buzzword increasingly is multiple data sources. You need, you need multiple data sources, you know, uh, archival data, uh, direct observation, uh, in electronic sources, uh, expert uh, sources, et cetera, et cetera. So triangulation of evidence, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But but more than two, right? Like multiple yeah, uh, evidence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, online, offline, everything. Um, 
which of course means that you need to be able to have access to the case. Access also and, and some level of, of fine-grained understanding also culturally, if you're talking about something in another you know, culture or country, like know the language, be able to read it, et cetera, et cetera. So, which, so, so some people say that you can only do really excellent case-based research on one single case because you will only be able, and people will work on one case for their whole life, potentially, right? Yes. They will become yes. the great specialists of one single case. Now, one kind of important limitation of this very interesting, very powerful strategy is, of course, um, well, one caveat or danger is the so-called idiosyncratic bias. Mm -hmm. So be, becoming ex extre uh, extremely focused on one particular situation, say Tunisia, and then trying to infer, okay, this is not a simple inference, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not statistical, but try to, gen yes, yes, to, yes. to generalize, to say, to, to a lot of other countries. This is kind of difficult and touchy to do. Uh, perhaps you can make some, some theoretical statements that could be tested in other places, but you cannot directly and briefly generalize. You, you can make some kind of thought experiments, okay, but if you don't go out there and get data and information, you will not be able to generalize. Yes, yes. So uh, that is basically what I want to, the big picture about case, uh, single case study. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to stress that there is multiple ways in which people do case-based uh, research. So there's no, it's not like one methodology. There is at least three or four main traditions, uh, let's say more or less uh, in terms, I'm talking here about a bit, a bit more about epistemology more or less mm -hmm. constructivist approaches, more or less, let's say, both positivist approaches, uh, more or less fully qualitative approaches, and also approaches using numbers. I mean, you can use numbers in single case studies. You can do, use descriptive statistics. You know, I mean, looking at, you know, budget flows in, in a given country or uh, whatever, uh, uh, membership patterns in a, in a particular party, you can do, but that, usually descriptive stats uh, uh, come, come in there in the picture. But I mean, I, I even thought of inferential statistics as as uh, as doable in a case based logic because uh, in what country you run your survey will very much determine uh, will will very much be determined by you know what's your research question is this a good case to analyze this research question in yeah. et cetera et cetera so so what I'm, what I'm saying here also is that you can use the language of variables right and logic of mm -hmm. variables also in single case studies. Uh, you can okay. separate attributes, right? And you can separate cost from effect. But, and then you, you yes. come more towards a more, let's say, post-positivist or more realist approach to, to social sciences, right? Where you're going to separate, you're going to take a step back and you're going to separate properties. And you're going mm -hmm. to think a bit like, like, like in the matrix kind of logic. Um, yes. And you, it will be possible for some of these factors or variables to quantify them. Say, in my research back then, in my PhD research, I was looking at the electoral you know, results of these parties and the, the amplitude of, say, an electoral defeat. And I could use some quantitative analysis for this, right? Yes. Okay. Makes sense. So perhaps I could move to uh, then, based on the limitation of the single case study, uh, there is yes. a whole other tradition, which is comparative research. Yes. Uh, now, um, if, I want, if I want to start from the other extreme side of the spectrum, well, quantitative research I mean, like statistical research is comparative, right? Because yes. when you do a regression, you, you compare the position of multiple points, right? Vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, in, in a bi-dimensional or multi-dimensional space, right? And yes, then yes. you draw your regression line, you, you do multiple comparisons across points, all right? Yes, but those points are people and not, <laughs> yeah, of course. not a bigger unit, yes. Yeah, yes. of course, of course. Uh, and, and when you do experiments, you compare, right? You compare the, the result of uh, with, with, without the stimuli uh, stimulus, right, uh, uh, with the placebo effect, etc. Right. So when you do experiments, you compare. Yes. And so um, there is an increasing amount of work being done. Uh, it's also a long tradition. I'll come back to that. Uh, um, trying to exploit the power of comparison, okay, of the comparative logic in social sciences, that comes actually from from the uh, uh, let's say more applied sciences in in a way, uh, and to to apply these two cases. So how can you compare cases in a meaningful way? And one way you can do this is doing what I call multiple cross-case research or comparative case research. Um, okay, so what are these? 
Yeah, so what you're doing here is you're moving away from the single case study, but you want to keep the, the ambition of keeping some level of within case knowledge. Yes. It means that you, you keep this idea that each case is a complex something. Like Tunisia between 2005 and 2011 is a complex something. So is Algeria, so is Yemen, so is in the same region Israel, so is uh, you know, Syria and so on and so forth. And you, and you, you, you start by naming this, these cases and you, to, to, to uh, so that's again, the casing operation as, as Byrne would say, David Byrne would say, or Charles Reagan. And you first have to um, make sure that they're comparable. That, there's, okay. there's, that you are not comparing apples and, and pears. Uh, and, and I would say comparing Tunisia with Israel, even though it's the same region, might be of course, exactly, problematic. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So in many ways, Israel is a sort of a Western society. It's something different in a way, right? Uh, so you, you take Israel out. And are you going to keep Lebanon in? Okay, Lebanon, mm, difficult because it's a different system. Lebanon is a sort of a semi-democracy, imperfect democracy, right? It's not an authoritarian system like Tunisia yes. or Algeria or Yemen or or Saudi Arabia, for the matter, and so you're going to you're going to need to uh, to define very carefully your population. Again, it's not a given. It's not like all voters in a given country. The population is also subject to, to definition. And let's say you're going to use the uh, the concept of uh, or the, the the label of MENA countries, Middle East and North African countries, mm -hmm. which, by the way, do not include Israel, which is a MENA country, but it's another type. Right. Yes. Yes. And these happen to be, let's say, mostly authoritarian uh, regimes. Some are monarchy, some are not monarchy, but they share some some overall features. And so you can compare them. And then, uh, based on this, you can basically uh, follow two approaches. Either you do pretty small end research, so you stick to the logic of really small end research, like you do typically a binary comparison. Okay. You're going to take two. Uh, countries, two cases, Let, let's follow this example, two countries, two cases with a contrasted outcome. Let's say one puzzling case, that'll be Tunisia, counterintuitive, unexpected, and one, let's say, uh, compliant case, uh, a system does not, that, that does not collapse in, uh, in spite of the same stimuli or, or, or yes, yeah, yeah, st stimulation in a way or, or challenges, Algeria or Morocco, okay? Uh, and uh, perhaps you could uh, follow, you could do a two by two actually comparison. You can compare Tunisia with Morocco and Tunisia with Algeria and Algeria with Morocco, right? And so you basically you yeah. could do uh, multiple pairwise comparisons across these three cases. And if you have time and money and knowledge, you can go to all three countries, do a deep case study on all three countries potentially. In and statistics, what, what, what you just suggested in statistics is a big no-no, like selecting your cases based on the outcome. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, but because here, of course, what you're going to do is you're not going to test a theory, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's yes. more a logic of discovery of what's happening in there, right? In these cases. Uh, and it, it is indeed an inductive logic, right? And yes. so in case or research, it actually is a good practice to select on the outcome to make sure. So the puzzle is exactly that. The puzzle is why or how, what is the process that has led to a, a, a a white outcome in one case and a black outcome in the other case, a contrasted outcome. So you do need to handpick your cases on both sides. Yes. Um, and perhaps here is a, a, a challenge, but that's, I think, for all social, social scientific work, also in quantitative research is our theories. Mm -hmm. Usually our theories are not so complete. They are kind of skewed towards one, one, you know, one, one side of the story. That there is there is much more literature on the success of revolutions than on their failure, right? On non-revolutions. Yes. But that's a, a, that's a bigger point. Uh, coming back to the operations. So first you, you name your cases, you define them in time and space, you make sure they're comparable, then you go to either very small n, as I just uh, told you, and you can do typically, for instance, you know, two deep case studies with multiple data sources. You could perhaps do something like uh, two process tracing analyses and you could unpack the mechanisms that will lead to this or that outcome in these two different cases. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and exactly what you would do in, with process tracing uh, would be, again, you're gonna uh, trace, right? You're going to unpack a sequence of mechanisms, right? That will start from point A to point Z, point Z be, being the outcome in a way. 
potentially a puzzling outcome. And what you will do for the case like Algeria, where you have not seen the collapse of the regime, you will see where a mechanism, uh, an expected mechanism has not occurred, where there's been a breach in the mechanism, right? And yes. then you will be able to identify where there has been like a, 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 a disjunction between the case of Algeria and the case of Tunisia by looking at the two black boxes. Yeah, but I, I wonder because because okay, so you bring up the the idea of tracing the mechanisms yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. now with the comparative case study. But if we talk to our third co-conspirator, Derek Beach, who we, we run the method school with, yeah. I think he would say that uh, he would say that. Uh, you can do process tracing in a single case. It doesn't have to be comparative. Absolutely, in yes. Fact, that's how yeah. it's mostly done. Yeah. Yeah. So process tracing is a single case, single case strategy, and I, I could have mentioned it earlier for the single case. Yes. Strategy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What I'm saying here is that you can exploit this logic in a very small n comparative research. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking okay. at one positive case, right, a typical case, and one less compliant or more puzzling case, you could do like two parallel uh, process tracing analyses. But it is indeed quite demanding. So uh, one should think twice before engaging in comparative research with process tracing. Right. Okay, but you could do, a, a, also you can also do a sort of a softer pairwise comparison, right? Uh, something like uh, uh, looking at all the evidence and making your own, you know, drawing your own conclusions in a, in a softer way, in a, in a less systematic way, less ambitious in a way than process tracing because Process tracing uh, requires lots, lots and of direct, you know, evidence, primary evidence. Yes. Like kind of day by day evidence. Yes. Just an example of how fine grained you should be. Uh, I had an excellent PhD researcher. Her name was Priscilla, who did uh, her PhD on this topic. By the way, of Tunisia and Algeria and, and, and MENA countries and the, the collapse or non-collapse of regimes. And she really had to go on the ground and interview people on the ground on the very spot where things happened and to examine exactly what happened and why and how some military people uh, or soldiers did not intervene to crush, to crush a given you know, uh, demonstration. And, yeah. what, and what, what was the mechanism precisely, what really happened. And she also had to, to look at the social media back then in Arabic and so on and so forth. Then she could unpack the reason why this regime chose not to crush the population. And that's the black box. Okay. Yeah. Now, that's still very small end logic. Yes. Uh, so perhaps what I want to highlight as a, another possibility is to think about comparison uh, across more than a few cases. Say like, th and, and, and that's, a, that's an interesting logic because think about it, if you think about complex cases like uh, larger cases, there's multiple situations where your population is not so large, say, the 28, uh, soon 27 EU countries, uh, you know, uh, the 22 regions, no, sorry, 16, no, 16 lender in, in Germany, or, you know, the whatever, how many, you know, the 15 uh, parties in the Israeli Knesset, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Usually, there's a lot of our, our, let's say, meso level or larger level cases, or macro level cases are limited in number, countries, uh, uh, specific social events. Uh, political events. Think also like in other disciplines, like in criminolo criminology, a certain type of, of you know, serial killers. <laughs> like there's a certain <laughs> type, there's not thousands of them around. So what do you do? Well, you can still pursue the logic of case-based research and possibly examining the whole population. Uh, and, okay. But then you cannot do the real case-based research anymore because you cannot actually go in depth in, with the same depth in 25 or 30 cases or even 15. You have to have another approach and it's sort of a, well, there's two, two views on this, right? Either you, you stick to K-based research, but then you, have, you cannot go so, so, like intermediate M, uh, or you choose to renounce to some level of depth and you can go to some level of, uh, uh, towards the logic of generalization, okay? Okay. Um, and so either you're going to do what some people would call pur purposive sampling. So let's say that you have in Germany, you have something like maybe, let's say, two or 300 economic basins in this country. Uh, like, uh, yeah, economic basins, so um, sub-regional, you know, like de facto units, uh, geographically, geographically speaking, okay? okay? And you're gonna handpick maybe 20, 30, 40 to make sure you have quite, you cover the diversity. And you're gonna do 20, 30, 40 shallow, 
case studies, but you still have some quite some richness of evidence across all these cases. And here you can address, you can try to address kind of more why questions. You can separate an outcome from some, some, some determinants, some, some factors, not using statistics. You could also do statistics, but with 40, it's very, very small, right? It's too, too small n usually. And you could use a tool such as QCA. So qualitative comparative analysis, you're going to uh, uh, handpick some regions, let's say these basins, some of which are, uh, let's say very strong economically and some others that are not strong economically. You have a contrasted outcome. And you're going to look, you're going to examine with QCA the combinations of factors that will lead uh, 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 together to, uh, to this contrasted outcome, depending on the case or clusters of cases, basically. So the interest of this, this logic is that it is still case informed, but it's, it, it brings you closer to, let's say, variable oriented research. You, know? you, can, you can move from the holistic logic that, uh, by which you cannot, and that is case based, by which you cannot generally, uh, sorry, you cannot generalize empirically to a systematic comparative approach where you can actually cautiously generalize from this purposive sample to a broader set of cases. I'm not saying the whole population, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm being yes. very cautious. This is not a statistical, statistical inference. Uh, Charles Regan calls this modest generalization or limited historical generalization. You can slightly expand your findings but slightly beyond your, your cases. Things like in my own research, when I use QCA, I was examining 14 green, green parties in Europe mm -hmm. uh, over their, their whole lifespan. But actually my cases were split in time because there were different periods. So I had something like 40, 50 cases, cases, right? Cases were my parties in the, at different time points. They were not independent, okay, cases. Mm -hmm. um, that's another topic. But <laughs> based on this, I could cautiously expand my findings to red green parties. Because red green parties that I had not uh, examined empirically do share quite a high number of attributes or properties with these green parties. And so you can modestly, you can make some, let's say some, some bets in a way, uh, safe bets, I would say informed bets that, that your conclusion would also apply to other cases for further research, of course. Yes. Now, okay. so what is important to mention here is that if you, are, if you want to infer from a sample to, to a population, you should not do case-based research. Mm -hmm. That's the logic. That's not the logic. The logic is to be safe in your case, right? And to try to, 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 to develop in-depth knowledge. Now, and then you can engage towards some uh, generalization. So a sort of inference, but not statistical by adding up cases, by having more in a way, observations. But of course it is challenging because uh, multiple case research requires a lot of access to multiple cases. Yeah. It is and, perhaps and, easier and when you uh, work in a given, let's say, space, in a given country, right, with sub-national uh, cases or these kind of things. Let's say, let's say that you work on, on Hungary and you are going to, your case is going to be leaders or political entrepreneurs in, in, in the Budapest area. Okay, great. Then it's easy because the terrain is not so large. But yeah. if, you, if you're covering, you know, a whole set of EU countries or even broader, that's more challenging. Yeah, I was just going to say that access is 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 you you just threw that word out like it's uh, it's something simple, but it's not. It's actually very very complicated because because uh, as you mentioned earlier, you need to know the culture, the language, the etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, which if you work within a case like within a country with uh, sub case or sub subunits basically as cases, then maybe it's more feasible. But yeah, yeah. But and, and there's actually there is a uh, there is a uh, um, a tension between the number of cases you can actually handle and the level of intimacy that you can have for each case. Uh, yes. So the more cases you add, the more, you know, the more depth you lose. Uh, uh, and eventually when you do, uh, if, if, you, if you go towards larger end uh, logic, like if you do a, a, a voting survey, electoral survey, you know, you know quite little about each voter, right? You know, you know, you have a series of answers from a respondent at a survey, right? Uh, of an online survey, right? We don't know much about each case, individual, right? So let's say you're let's say you're a young scholar, um, you know, PhD scholar. Yes, I um, used to be young a long time ago. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that, yes, but I, I mean, you, you've met these people even more recently, right? So, uh, um, so let's say, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, how do you resolve this conflict? I mean, as a young scholar, how much in depth should I go? Should I just take a few cases and go very much in depth? Or should I, uh, should I make very shallow case studies? Uh, what, what would you say to them? What would, is, there, is there a good rule of thumb? I know there isn't, but is there something they can hold on to? I think um, I have two answers, actually, two very different ones. The first okay. one is, is non-scientific in a way, is mm -hmm. what do you like to do as a person? Mm -hmm. So that would be a very much, uh, uh, it's not scientific. Do you it's like okay. to actually get your hands dirty in a case? To go out there and meet people, right, and and, and you know and, and and read archives and you know get your hands dirty in a way. Or let me let, let, yeah, let yeah. me let me stop you right there as, uh, already because I encounter this all the time at CEU. So we have a very diverse student body, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and I always I always tell them that uh, that it's it's it can be very good research to go home to your home country, which I know is what you're interested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to go home and apply some theory that you found in the West that has never been applied to your 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 country. So let's take a look. Uh, that can be a good research, but really, an excellent research is not that. The excellent research is to figure out for what grand theory debate is your case, is your country a good case that it could contribute. So kind of use a reversed logic is, 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 okay, there are many debates out there in the field which you might be interested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think of your country and try to figure out where can it contribute. So don't just apply what's out there to your country. See where your country can apply back to the theoretical debates. Yeah, so I think basically um, the, the, the core arbitration would be, um, I would say, what would pull you towards case studies would, would be the logic of deep understanding. Yes. And not the logic of you know, statistical inference. So yeah. if, if you want to uh, gain, gain a deep understanding of a, a given situation, then a case study helps a lot. Yeah. But you will not be able to infer to, to, to many other, other situations, uh, empirically speaking or directly, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's, that would be the, the, the first driver, the logic of understanding. And the second driver would be your ability, but that's, it's more like a condition, your ability to go beyond uh, secondary, secondary data data. You mm -hmm. need to produce at least partly some primary data yourself. You have to, to be able to have, and that's where access comes into play, right? Yes. Uh, and, and so meet people, you know, go out there, get interviews, whatever, archives. It's multiple ways. Uh, again, multiple data sources is very important. Here are two things. Understanding, uh, 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 let's say, a deeper goal of having a deeper understanding on the one hand and having access as a condition. Um, and what would drive you towards comparison would be potentially uh, if you want to move towards generalization. But you cannot go much further towards this inference because you, your n would be too low any case, any, anyhow, because you want to keep this complex system uh, logic. And you, are, you cannot uh, process 1,000 complex cases uh, because these are not lines in the, in the matrix. These are each, each uh, case is, is, a, is a story. Or perhaps you could do this in an, in an automated way, but that's something different then. Yes. Then that's perhaps something like social network analysis. That's something very different. Yes, yes. So, so uh, as somebody who has already done political science in the previous millennia, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that uh, the relative value of these things change over time. So you, yeah. you probably have seen it all. But right now, what do you think uh, is... Where, where do you think the emphasis is? Is it on, on in-depth understanding of single cases or generalization? Where would you say the emphasis is? Uh, what, what does the discipline value today more? I, as, as, you, as we all know, social sciences are very diverse. So yeah. you've got all sorts of groups who have different beliefs <laughs> and different mm -hmm. goals, right? Uh, yes. um, and so I would say, to cut a long story short, that um, there are different epistemic communities. Uh, there, there is a diverse uh, uh, a group of people doing case-oriented research. Actually, there's multiple subgroups in there. Um, and, and some uh, are closer, let's say, to the, to the uh, logic of anthropology. And they believe you can only do, I mean, genuine uh, case-based research is only single case research. It's long-term, it's like, you know, working 30 years on your case in a way, a few first years for your PhD, and then you continue working on that case. 
that's you know the logical anthropology it's it, it get, you know getting, going out there and becoming part of the system in a way of, of, that you're analyzing and then you've got multiple other other you know subgroups in there um, then you have I think a second drawing a community of people doing comparative uh, case-based research among whom those who are using QCA which is only one of the subgroups uh, and some people who are using QCA uh, are pulling it more towards the smaller end uh, case informed you know angle that's more kind of more my perspective some others are developing QCA towards the larger end uses so using QCA also for the meta-analysis of you know of quantitative data sets that's another logic right and then you have, of course, people doing quantitative research. Uh, I mean, statistics, statistics uh, 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 oriented research, exploring the, the power of statistics. And that's still another group. So, or maybe sub subgroups, different sub subgroups out there, right? Uh, doing, so low tech statistics and higher tech and different you know, strands in there, multiple communities. So I think mm -hmm. to cut a long story short, I think one really interesting way to think about this in, in a project is to go potentially mixed method or multi-method I know it's challenging, mm -hmm. but perhaps you can split your project in two or three phases. And let's say uh, you could do a, an inter in intermediate end research to, exp to explore stuff. Like you could cover all the MENA countries that I mentioned earlier to look at the patterns of these regimes across say, you know, a certain number of, let's say of, of reigns of different, you know, of sovereigns in these countries or rulers. You could have a population of, of up to 30, 40 cases potentially. And then you would zoom in, that's with you the first analysis, a comparative analysis with QCA, for instance, small or intermediate and research. Then you would have a focused case study on Tunisia. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a single case study. And potentially, why not? You could, you know, you could do some sort of, I don't know what, time series analysis on multiple, multiple, you know, looking at economic results of all these countries year by year or month by month. But that's another you know, story in, in, in your research using large end research. So macro level data, macro data, right? Uh, from whatever you know, source, the World Bank, anything, and you do quantitative analysis on these all, all these countries at multiple time points. Yeah, so yeah, in a way, I really like I really like the response because um, what you're saying is that you shouldn't care what the discipline cares about right now. You should uh, focus on your own community of research, figure out what they want, because yeah. you want to be contributing to that sub community and not necessarily political science as a whole. But mm -hmm. also, mixed method research and multi method research is 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 very much what we place value on right now. And we go back to triangulation of evidence. So in that case, I think uh, yeah. I think uh, or, or uh, even further. Yeah, no, I I asked the wrong question. I, point taken. I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think basically, uh, just a, a, a one point on your know, mixed or multi method research. Uh, again, there's the discussion on labels. That's a long story, but. Um, there's two ways you can look about uh, at this. One way is kind of, of ambitious, is forcing yourself to integrate your research, right? Yes. To really uh, feed qualitative information in quantitative, whatever, uh, analysis and so on and so forth. That's more integrative, that's more ambitious, but you can also uh, look, at thing, look at your project as being different stages or different sub-projects that are semi-autonomous. Like you have, you're gonna produce three or four papers or three papers in your PhD research. <clears throat> one of them is going to be fully exploratory and fully qualitative, right? That's one, one, one sub-project. Then it's closed, okay? Then you have another sub-project that's, that's quantitative. Yeah. Uh, and that's informed by the first stage, right? So you should not force yourself to integrate. You, you can tell different parts of a story with different research questions, by the way. Mm -hmm. Not only one research question, but different sub-research uh, questions by a bit of your project, of your, in the sequence of your project. Well, great. Um, any final thoughts uh, to add? Did we hit all the points? Oh, no, perhaps uh, uh, one point I always make when I teach methods in general is, okay, uh, what is the, what should be your mind frame as, as a researcher when you think about methods? And I, will say, I always say two things. The first thing is a method is a means. So it's not a goal in itself. So you should use a method if it suits your, your needs. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I mentioned your know, generalization or deep understanding, okay? You need a different toolbox depending on your, on your goal. Uh, secondly, yeah. I would say be pragmatic, be pragmatic. So you can do 
um, case study in a very, very demanding way, extremely demanding way that's extremely time consuming and challenging, or you can, you know, be a bit less demanding, you're going, it's going to be a bit more shallow, and that's okay. You just mentioned the limitations. You know, same with, you know, when you do a survey, if you want to do a top survey, it's very costly and, and you know, and, and you need, you know, a really large, kind of a large sample and there's all issues, you know, then you do the ESS, right? The European yeah. Social Survey, right? If you don't yeah. have that kind of money, okay, you do a survey, it's going to be more modest, be pragmatic. Same with case-based research. You always have to be pragmatic and you have to be transparent about the limitations of your research. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's very good advice because you know never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. <laughs> so yeah, because in in a way uh, uh, you always have, all, especially in case based research, you you, you will all, there will always be caveats, you know, and and blanks, you know, blind spots in your case knowledge. You you have to be transparent about it, and you can say, okay, right, right, beyond my project. So please give me some more budgets, and I can do a second case study, right, more focused, you know, and and go more in depth. Yeah, 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 and yeah. If you if you if you have a not so perfect study, that's that's uh, that's good. That is always grounds for asking for money. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That, that's that's what that's what we all should do. And, and it's cumulative. That's what we all do yeah. actually. A good research is always cumulative. Of yeah. course, just as an open point of conclusion, perhaps. Of course, one major difficulty of case-based research is that it's it's less easy to accumulate uh, the research because. Uh, a given researcher will do his, his or her monograph on a given case, and then you cannot you can never fully prolong a, a monograph because it's mm -hmm. not like adding up you know further labor information. Each uh, researcher will discover different things, but that's one big debate behind qualitative research. Qualitative research or capable research is less easy to accumulate, or, and uh, and of course cannot be replicated. That's one another issue to be discussed. Yes, that's a deeper issue. Well. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, sharing the wisdom. And uh, and um, yeah, hopefully this information was was useful to people. So uh, okay. once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us and uh, say bye to everybody. Bye. Okay, bye. Ciao.